Welcome everyone. A special greeting to our students today. I guess our numbers this year have tripled, so we do appreciate the participation of our students, so welcome. I'm Bev Hubley, the Director of Business Operations for Information Technology Services and your MC for today. Dalhousie University is once again pleased to hold this half-day conference, recognizing Data Privacy Day 2012. This is a global initiative recognized around the world to raise awareness and, pro and to promote privacy education. Remember, privacy is everyone's concern. Thanks to our sponsors, Cisco, Bell Alliant, and Eastlink. If you have the opportunity, please speak to them during the refreshment break. There's a few of them are sitting up here to my right, and we have Cisco at the back with a table. A few housekeeping items I want to go over. Um, if at all possible, when you exit this room, if you could use the back door, please. Likewise, the washrooms can be reached. Go out the back door here to your right. Again, I mentioned there will be a network break about 1.40, um, 20 minutes. You can mingle at the back tables, have a coffee, chance to refresh your drinks. There will be prize draws at the end of today. And if you're, you've all been registered for that event, so your names have all been entered automatically. Our main giveaway today will be a, a, the Kobo e-reader, so it'll be worth staying for that. And you must be present to win. You'll notice on, there's a couple of agenda items on your tables. There's a, an e-book offer that's a limited offer it's for a book called LOL, Oh My God, What Every Student Needs to Know About Online Reputation Management, Digital Citizenship, and Cyberbullying. In honor of Data Privacy Month, it is being made available for free from January 27th till January 30th. As well, I want to talk about a conf an upcoming conference called Information with a Borders Conference. This is a student-led professional conference initiated by the School of Information Management. It's February 12th. There is a link to that event as well on your agendas. Oh, sorry, February 9th. Apologies. Sometime later this afternoon, you'll receive a, a survey email from us to ask for your feedback for this particular conference. Please take the time to fill that out and return it to us. That would be great. I just want to mention the tables that are at the back of the room. Cisco, our partnering sponsor, is at the back. We also have the Dalhousie School of Information Management, KPAPA, the Canadian Association of Professional Access and Privacy Administrators, the FOIPOP Oversight Office, Nova Scotia Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Review Office, ARMA International. So during the break, please visit those groups and say hi. Bob Doherty is here representing KPAPA. If there's anyone interested in KPAPA certification, you can meet Bob after today's event. Just gather at his table at the back and to find out more information. So that's it for the housekeeping. I'd now like to introduce our first speaker, Michael Power, is a lawyer and consultant based in Toronto, advising national and international clients on technology, privacy, and security related issues. Beginning his career as a corporate commercial lawyer in Halifax, Nova Scotia, he joined the Department of Justice in Ottawa, advising on trade, investment, and technology-related issues. After leaving government, he became a partner at the national law firm and then vice president's privacy and security at a crown agency. Michael has written extensively on privacy and information security issues. He is the author of the Access to Information and Privacy title of Halsbury's Laws of Canada and co-author of the American Bar Association's best-selling Sailing in Dangerous Waters, a Director's Guide to Data Governance. He is currently working on a third book on privacy to be published by the LexisNexis in 2012, and his blog may be found at www.michaelpower.ca. 
Michael Power currently serves on the Board of Directors of the Canadian Association of Professional Access and Privacy Administrators. He is a member of the Nova Scotia Barrister Society and the Law Society of Upper Canada. And I also found out today that Michael Power was the Dalhousie Student Union President, 1978 to 1979. So Michael, welcome back home. Thank you. All right. How you all doing? Interactive moment, come on. All right. Am I technically set up here? Am I on? Bear with me, we have technology issues. There we go. This is brand new, by the way. It's yours, but I may steal it. It's got a vibrator in it, you know, if you go too long in a slide. Okay. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk to you about e-health and privacy. And if I pause occasionally, it's because I'm having flashbacks. Um, this building does not look like anything um, from 1978. You know, 19, I graduated in 1983 from the law school. So um, um, I'm still having, getting used to the fact that the Greywood, the Greywood, how's that? Am I okay? The Greywood is uh, not on the third floor, but down where the, uh, the cafeteria used to be. So what we're going to do is I'm going to take about 30, 30 minutes to talk briefly about the subject of e-health and privacy, the connections, the issues um, that you should be considering as concerned citizens, and so as a taxpayer, somebody who pays money, because you're paying for the health care system in part, and um, you, it's your personal information and it's your most sensitive personal information, your health information. So what we're going to do, this tells you a little bit about me. That's the book, the Halsbury book, highly recommended if you have insomnia. Um, it's a very hardcore legal text. That's the uh, ABA book. Um, and the sad thing about that book is I wrote it, I co-wrote it in 2005. Um, and it talks about issues, you know, emerging issues, trends, threats, vulnerabilities, and nothing's changed. The book is not dated. That's a sad thing. Seven years old and it's not dated. Um, here's our agenda, a little environmental scan. A little talk about technology, not much. The concerns, the future, and then a conclusion. And we're going to have about 20 minute Q&A. So uh, if you have comments or questions, you can raise them at that time. So the first thing I want to do is in terms of environmental scan, you have to recognize that healthcare in Canada is a mix of public and private services. And you have to think in terms of an ecosystem. You have to think in terms of a continuum of care. You know, we all think about doctors, we all think about um, hospitals, but it's really, when you think about healthcare, it's also the uh, VON nurse who comes to your house to visit your uh, sick relative or your ailing mother. Um, it's community care. It's not only just doctors, but it's uh, mental health practitioners. In some respects, social workers. Um, when you think about the healthcare system, it's health researchers. Dalhousie has a very active uh, medical school here, along with other institutions across the country. They're very interested in health data. Um, but recognizing that our healthcare system uh, is what it is, and you probably saw recently press reports out of the federal government capping healthcare funding in 2014, or actually 2016, you know, 6% up to then, and then basically 4% after that. Um, because of that, the healthcare system is facing um, funding stress, demographic pressures, and you can see from this McLean's uh, cover that uh, people aren't quite happy with our healthcare system. And they actually did a survey um, with respect to people's attitudes. And the Canadian numbers are stood out here. And you can see people are ready for change in terms of our healthcare system. But of course, can you get agreement on what that change should be? And I'm not here to talk about the healthcare system per se, and I'm not here to talk about that change in that healthcare system. But certainly for the last 10 years, uh, since 2000, last 12 years really, um, what you have seen is that it has been recognized that technology has a role to play in how that healthcare system evolves. And that issue, believe it or not, you would have thought might have been settled 10 years ago 
with the establishment of Ca Canada Health InfoWay, with the funding of various initiatives, with all that kind of stuff. But believe it or not, it's still evolving and it's still changing. So when you look at these numbers, um, people aren't happy with what they have. They want it to change, but we're still looking for that consensus about where it should go. So here's what we spend. It's a lot of money. You know, I show you the slide to you just to give you a sense that it is not trivial health care. You probably intuitively knew that, but some people really don't see the numbers. And when you see that, when I talk about it being a mix of public and private, um, we all think we have a public health care system. We don't. We really have a private health care system, but there is the payment for that system, for the services rendered by that system, uh, is funded 70% by the public sector and 30% by the private. And the three big areas that I keep in mind are hospitals, drugs, and docs. So when you think about the need to change the system, the need to embrace technology, part of the reason why is that governments, as funders of healthcare, are really looking for ways to cut back on that, uh, to save money, and to cut back on that expenditure to the extent humanly possible while meeting their commitments. So when you think about it, um, you think about the drivers for technology and for electronic health records, electronic medical records, electronic personal health records. The deployment of technology within the healthcare system, it's very much from a government perspective. You hear, you hear talk about, well, it's, it'll be good for us. You can have one record anywhere in the country, which I find kind of ridiculous because generally, well, healthcare is local. Um, you hear all this talk about the benefits derived from electronic health records, and I trust me here, I'm not being negative about them. I'm saying be careful. Everybody remember that Hill Street Blues show? A little interactive moment here. Come on, some of you older folks like me can put up your hand a little bit. <coughs> remember the death sergeant, you know, at the beginning of the show, and he'd give that little, you know, he talked to everybody, give the briefing and all that. And they'd end it by saying, be careful out there. And when it comes to technology and healthcare, probably if you take one message to take away from this particular presentation is be careful out there, okay? Because we're not quite sure of all the implications associated with the digitization of health information. So government, everybody says it's good for you. Keep in mind that government's looking from the point of view, how do I save money? Because this sucker's bleeding me dry. So federal money, I'll briefly touch upon this. Remember I said about 2014, that is, you, you probably saw a lot of the Fed, I think there was a, a provincial conference of ministers last week talking about health care funding. I saw a piece on the Globe yesterday about it. Um, the outcomes were, let's study the issues more, and we're not happy with the fact that the Feds are just going to give us money, and they've set the level, and there's no negotiation because there are no strings attached. There's nothing to negotiate. The Feds are writing a check. Here is some of the... Um, Here's some of the drivers that are associated with it. Um, and I think the last bullet you have to keep in mind is that from a federal perspective, they're looking at it from the point of view of sustainable health care funding. Um, this is just to give you a sense of the provinces have no money. Um, you look at the red numbers, and it's pretty sad. Um, but that's the deficits that are contemplated uh, or certainly over this year and, um, and to come. So provinces, they are up against it in terms of what they contribute, what they pay for health care. And the feds are saying, we're not going to be giving you a blank check anymore. Um, here, just to give you a little bit of environmental scan again, the stars represent uh, provinces or jurisdictions that have health privacy legislation. Some of it have dedicated legislation. I understand that uh, Nova Scotia has just received royal assent. Um, so you now have a, a Personal Health Information Protection Act of your own, similar to Ontario's. Uh, some jurisdictions uh, don't have what I would characterize as a separate standalone piece of legislation. What they do is that they have legislation dealing with um, personal information protection and health information protection within either uh, health legislation governing um, the professions or entities um, providing health care services in their jurisdictions, uh, or they have public sector legislation that is extended to hospitals 
um, and practitioners to a certain degree. So in terms of the map, what you see in terms of legislation is um, pretty comprehensive in that some part of the country has legislation dealing with it. How am I doing so far? You know, interactive moment, everybody sort of... John, you didn't tell me it was going to be this tough an audience. <clears throat> so when you think about... I have to be careful where I am here. When you think about... Um, personal information, uh, personal health information, and all those little stars. Keep in mind that, you know, people talk about, we have Data Privacy Day, okay, which is actually a bit of a misnomer here in Canada, because for the most part, we really don't have privacy legislation. We have personal information protection legislation. Ontario, you know, Personal Health Information Protection Act, they don't call it Privacy Act. We all sort of consume uh, or believe that privacy equals information protection. And this is, when, this is a little bit of the be careful out there uh, message, because in large part, we don't. When you think about privacy legislation, it's really under the Charter of Rights. Uh, and this isn't a legal lecture, but uh, what we have is information um, protection uh, statutes. And you know, it's sort of, as I tell my clients, um, you know, they say, well, there were rules. We have to follow the rules. And I tell them and I say that the rules are the least important thing you'll find in any legislation. It's always the exceptions. And when you look at Pepita, Pipita, how do you pronounce it down here anyway? There are regional variations in the pronunciation of the federal statute. Pipita, okay. Um, I was involved, I was actually at the meeting where, where it was decided that um, it would become PIPEDA because it used to be the Personal Information Protection Act and the Electronic Documents Act. And then uh, Don Boudria called us into a room and said, you, we're not gonna give the opposition two kicks at the can, you have to merge the bills, you have to do it tonight. And so we went away, Heather Black and I went away, met with the drafters and we did that. And then they said, what do you wanna call this thing? And it was 11 o'clock at night, we were just too tired and we said to hell with it. We'll just call it Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act. A little trivia about how that, that legislation came about. So, can't get too close to speakers, apparently. So, um, you look at the exceptions. You look at the exceptions in a personal health information statute. You look at the exceptions in a privacy statute. Personal health information statute, they have an even larger number of exceptions for very different purposes. So, look at the exceptions. You think you might have privacy, you think you might have protection. But what I would ask you to do, very carefully, and they're hard statutes to read. I, you know, some people swear they're the greatest thing since sliced bread, but as a practitioner who has to advise clients, they're, they're difficult statutes to read. They do, their, they do achieve their objective, but they are difficult to read. But for the most part, what you find is that there are a lot of exceptions for a lot of different purposes. And the reason for that is that there are a lot of stakeholders in the system. So, so I'm gonna briefly talk about Technology. So I've said, okay, we've got an environmental stand. There's pressures to go to the use of technology in healthcare, electronic medical records, electronic health records. Um, there's money drivers. There is legislation, but the legislation doesn't necessarily give you the kind of protection that you think you have. Um, so now let's talk about the technology, because sometimes technology can be very helpful in providing the protection that we want. So. And I understand this is a recent, I love this slide, by the way. Um, and I understand it's a local one. But I couldn't resist. Come on. Cut me some slack. Um, so it continues to evolve. And when you think about technology, it's going very mobile. Um, you know, I have a colleague who once told me a story about he closed off Slater Street in Ottawa had a big crane and all that sort of stuff because he was a project manager who had to put a mainframe computer into a building and they put it on like the seventh floor of the building so they closed the street off, took the windows out, hoisted it up in a crane, threw it right through the window. Um, that was these days back in 1960s, 70s. Now, you know, your little PDA, you know, has a lot of computing power. And sooner or later, what you'll find is that um, we're gonna be going in that direction in terms of the use. And uh, what was it? 
Which hospital? There's a hospital in Ottawa. Um, the Ottawa General. You know, they bought something like a thousand iPads to give the physicians and staff. You know, so you're saying, well, there's all this. What about all this electronic technology out there now and all that sort of stuff? Well, the trouble is, is that you have to think of, dis of technology in terms of being disruptive, and it changes business processes. It changes the way that things happen. And change is not a bad thing, but what we are terrible at in a business world and what most people are bad at in terms of information management and information protection is that we suck at change management. Problems happen. Processes continue where we collect more information than we should because the business process, the business requirements, yes, they've changed, but we haven't really noticed or, or redefined the changes. So all you need to know, take away from this slide, is that the world is getting more mobile. Something you probably already know, but that is also coming to healthcare, and it's coming in a big way. And the reason I say that is that, you know, we, you hear everybody talking about electronic health records. And if you want to understand the complexity of the use of technology in healthcare, and I'm very deliberate in that choice of words, the use of technology in healthcare, because when people talk about electronic health records, you know, they think it covers the waterfront and it doesn't. It only covers one particular subset of the three major subsets, if I can use that term. You go into a doctor's office, you know, you go into, uh, what is it, an apple tree uh, clinic, a doctor with a sort of a tablet that types in stuff. You will see physicians having electronic medical records or records, electronic records in their offices. These are electronic medical records. They're distinct from electronic health records. Electronic health records really refer to a virtual where you have information from different sources that can be assembled at a particular point in time for the purposes of providing health care to an individual. So, you know, in a hospital, I want to be able to pull pictures. Uh, I want to be able to pull um, clinical notes if I can get them from uh, the NEMR. So when you think about electronic health records, you know, that's the Canada Health InfoWay vision of the world. Um, in the last tranche of funding by Canada Health InfoWay, something like $600 million a couple of years ago, um, that money was not for electronic health records. And we can have a debate about the utility, the functionality of electronic health records. They're you know, the, the, the track record to date. Don't really want to go there because I'm neutral about electronic health records. I'm very positive about electronic medical records. And I think because of the way technology is going, personally, I think we're going to be soon moving to what I would characterize as more personal health records where you are the custodian of your health data. Um, we're not there yet because we have integrity issues with respect to data. Physicians don't necessarily want to trust the data that you show up with on your tablet. But there are people out there who are trying to work on solutions to deal with that now, uh, where you get a verification by a physician, that kind of thing. So when you think of this, keep this terminology in mind. And when you think electronic health records, ask yourself, are they really talking about that, which is something very different? Uh, or are they talking about the stuff in a physician's office? Or are they talking about the stuff I'm walking around with in my uh, iPhone or my tablet? <coughs> So think different types of data. When you think about either he electronic health records or even electronic medical records, um, this is the, the various categories of e-health data that we're talking about. Um, generally, when you think about the systems that are being built across the country in different provinces, the, um, <coughs> the architectures may be slightly different, but generally, they're all designed to build systems that capture this kind of stuff. Um, to date, the history has been mixed. Um, some might say bad if you read Auditor General reports. Some might say good. Uh, I'm not here to debate it. Um, but when you think about your information, you know, it's not when you just go to your doctor and you tell them, you know, I'm feeling, I've got a pain in my stomach. What you have is that, you know, you have these different characteristics of, of information. Excuse me for a second. I still doing okay? I feel like I'm doing a Robin Williams here, just sort of taking out a bottle of water, you know? You ever see his, you know, he's got those four million bottles of water on his table? 
So. so I want you to think different types of data. And these are them. And there's no particular magic in, in the data. Just be aware of them. Um, I want you to think about new ways of the data being used. So for example, remote monitoring, data sharing. So um, for patient care, which is what we all think about, you know, when I need this electronic health, this one record, no matter where you are in the country, you know, if you get hit by a bus in Vancouver, we'll be able to get your records from Halifax. Good luck with that, but um, for the most part, there is a certain degree of sense in, in the data sharing. Um, public health surveillance, you know, for those of you here, uh, this may not be a real issue, but people in Toronto remember SARS, and it's still vivid in the, in the memory of, of health officials, and they're very concerned to make sure they never have another SARS. And of course, health research, which would be something that would be of interest to people here. But we also have to think about electronic communication between and amongst patients and providers. And I'll touch upon this a little bit briefly. And this is certainly a social media aspect of um, patients, you know, because, uh, you know, you have doctors who will tell you that, you know, for their chronic patients, their chronic disease patients, these patients sometimes know more about the disease than they do, simply because they get on the internet and they research the heck out of it. And they talk, and they talk to each other. We haven't got to the point yet where um, physicians will talk. How many people talk to their doctor by email, just out of curiosity? Got one. Okay, you're a very lucky man. Anybody else? Okay. Generally, they don't like to do that. Um, they're not adverse to doing it, but um, they're not paid to do that. The compensation system for the payment of physicians really does not is not geared or facilitates the use of email. So we have a compensation issue, a structural issue that we have to address before they start using it. And in some research to date, and certainly in some private conversations that I've had with people like um, Ellen Brookstone, uh, who runs the EMR report out of Vancouver, physicians are really interested in using email to talk to their patients. And the sad thing is, and, uh, well, not, Alan didn't tell me this. I've had this from other conversations with physicians. The sad thing is it's not because the patient would want it or the physician would want it, but it makes life easier for the physician's own office staff. And that's the target audience that if they talk to their patients by email, it takes, it takes the stress off their office staff. And that would be the reason why they would do it, as opposed to for the benefit of the patient. But part of me sort of goes, well, who cares? They're talking to the patient. The patient gets the answer they want. At the end of the day, that's what it's about. But people are starting to think about this, and you should too. So when you think about privacy, data protection, and e-health, and the implications for privacy, a lot more information is going around. And any security person will tell you, when you think about data, you have to think about data in motion and data at rest. Those are the two things that you're trying to protect. Data in motion, we think about physical security, we think about encryption, uh, we think about you know servers, all that kind of stuff. Data in motion, we're talking about either using the web or using email or using any kind of data transmission, really, uh, and trying to figure out how to put a pipe around that so nobody gets at it. And nobody messes with it, because it's not about just the confidentiality of information in an electronic environment. It's also the integrity, because people are going to make decisions about this data. <coughs> Think information liquidity. So when you talk about e-health, right, and this sort of segues a little bit into a technology issue and a little bit into a security issue. But you have to think about identity and access management, data sharing, dynamic information management. Something changes, it's got to be updated. Uh, transaction management, somebody's got to pay for it maybe. Or if there's something that somebody places an order, you know, for a lab test, you know, you want to be able to track and manage that particular transaction. So think about, and I characterize all this as that these are systems and services that are designed to facilitate the, the liquidity of information. And electronic health systems and electronic medical systems to a certain degree, and even personal health systems, what they're designed to do is make it easier to share information, your information. And you may say, and I'm going to tell you what, you're like me, you know, you don't care. 
Well, one level you do, another level you don't. Well, why say you don't care? If you're sick, you know, you, you don't care how big the circle of care is. You just want somebody to fix your problem, make you better. And when we go to physicians and we go to hospitals, that's why we're there. And that's why we say everything. But this conversation, if you'll allow me to characterize it that way, isn't about that. It's really about, well, what happens after you're better? Because that information, that don't disappear. That's still there. And then so another people, and guess what? That has value. That's worth something to somebody. So now you have to start thinking about secondary uses. You know, and you have to think about who might be interested in that data. And it's not necessarily for business purposes. I mean, last week we had uh, a, a tort of, I'll call it invasion of privacy for now, recognized in Ontario. Because one woman was spying on another woman over four years. You know, they worked at the same bank. You know, Ann Kavukian was pulling out her hair because she issued an order against the Ottawa General Hospital when um, one staff member looked at the data of uh, another staff, uh, the wife of another staff member, she was dating, you know, two staff members and a, and a third party, and one of them was looking at, you know, this third party's medical records when they came in. And Anne hit the roof, said this was entirely wrong, issued an order, you know, saying fix it, make sure this doesn't happen again. And three years later, she had to issue a second order, same hospital, same fact scenario. All right. People are people. They like looking at stuff, you know, if it's in their interest. You know, they want to do it. So, and I'll touch upon that a little bit later. But think information liquidity. Think about it's there in the system. Think about who's accessing it, why they're accessing it, what they're going to get out of it. Think stakeholders. Because it may, you think it's your data. Everybody else thinks it's theirs. And they have an interest in it. And if it's not theirs, they want access to it. So government because they've got to pay for this thing, right? And they're, you know, they don't have much money. Health authorities, because God forbid you turn out to be patient zero. Public and private health care research. Providers are interested in it. You know, and patients, you're interested in it. And not all of these players are at the table when we talk about the governance of electronic uh, medical records, electronic health records. And that's another aspect that you have to think about in terms of an implication of the system. So think stakeholders and think different interests. I found this, this was uh, in a blog after Kim's. I don't know if you know Kim's. it's a big medical conference, big health conference down in Florida. And when I first read it, I said I, w I was actually stunned at the statement. And then my second reaction was, oh my god, he's right. And I, when you think about putting information into electronic health records, which are big databases. Everybody heard the buzzword, you know, the buzzword for 2012? One of the buzzwords for 2012 was big data. Anybody heard that? Interactive moment? No? Whoops. Okay, somebody in the back. Thank you. <laughs> Whoa. <clears throat> I guess we know what your theme for next year will be. Big data. Um, well, electronic health databases, you can't get bigger data than that. Um, but keep, then keep in mind this, right? You know, you think about, well, it's really for me. They're, gonna, they're doing all this for patients. Um, guess what? This is a very clear statement that other people see that pile of data and think that they can use it for other purposes. Now you may say, go ahead. You know, if you suitably anonymize it, you take my name, you make sure that it can't be associated with me. But then I would ask you to go talk to Khaled el at the University of Ottawa, who's a statistician and who's done in Latanya Sweeney out of, um, I believe, the University of Pittsburgh. And these are people who have done research into the anonymization of data. Khaled believes it can be done, but we're not doing it right now, and it can be done right. Uh, Latanya, she basically say, forget it. Nobody's anonymous. Sooner or later, I can get enough data points on you, I can identify you. 
you know. So when you hear we can make it anonymous, take that with a well, that with a big if. That's a, mm, depends if they do 50 different things, then maybe. But it can always be traced back to you because it will always be tagged that it's your data somewhere. It will never be completely divorced from you. Um, this is out of a report that was done 2009 for the Federal Office of the Privacy Commissioner, Jennifer Stoddard. And I've just sort of highlighted um, a couple of things here. Um, you know, the, the question about, this is again about health research, and these are really platforms of data for use by people. I keep looking up at that thing, make sure I don't set it off again. Um, and I just sort of highlight the, the points in blue, especially the second one. So I'll just leave them there, I'll let you read them for a second. But even in Canada, it's recognized that the governance of databases containing personal health information, we haven't quite got there yet. So everybody knows the Hippocratic Oath, right? Right? Oh, come on. Well, you do now. I just put it up. Okay. Here's the CMA. Principles for uh, uh, Protection of Patient Information. This is from 2011. Patients should be informed that, um, you know, you think it's between you and your doctor. The doctor puts it into a database for personal health information, or sorry, for electronic health information purposes. So this is, you can look this up. It's online. It's on the web, you know. Your doctor can't guarantee it. And the CMA says they should tell you that. So you're thinking, okay, is this stuff all secure? It's all good? Everybody's taking care of things? And even the physicians don't even believe that. Concerns, it's really about secondary use at the end of the day. They're commercial, other people getting this information and using it for other purposes, government. Um, you know, national security, law enforcement, um, criminal, well, you know, if you go for the weakest point, it's not so much your health records, but it's the associated identification data with it if that allows me to create an identity. Um, and data quality, because you know those, any IT person will tell you that, you know, those little electrons, you know, that make up that document, one or two of them have a nasty habit of disappearing, especially over time. So um, concerns about data corruption, data loss, the data integrity of electronic health information um, is an issue that I, I certainly think there should be a little bit more research in that space. At the end of the day, you know, it's the fear of undesirable consequences. Um, that's the concerns that we have when we talk about any kind of storage of personal information and personal health information uh, outside of our control in an electronic database. Okay. I'm running out of time here, so I'm going to try data breach. Here's a, another cartoon for you. Interactive moment. This is where you laugh. <laughs> okay. Quiet. Sorry. <clears throat> um, this is the Ponyman uh, report from December 11th. I just point to the arrow. Um, this is the American experience. Uh, we don't really have data on the Canadian experience. Another good research topic for you if you're out there, if you're interested. Um, but I don't think the Canadian experience is really that different from the American one. 96% um, had a data breach uh, of, of health care uh, providers had a data breach in the last two years. The causes, they're, you know, there's no difference. They're the same. People are people. You lose stuff. Um, you make a mistake. Um, the last one, yeah, a couple of things here I want to point out, and this relates to the trends 81% store data on mobile devices. And this one, they don't know, 61% lack confidence in their knowledge of where, where it's located. I know I'm running out of time. Um, so um, the management, the security of personal health information is a very real issue, I would say, in North America. We have American data, but I would ask you the same question down here. The future. Very Star Trek-y. You like the little sparkles? It just materialized. You know. um, 
disruptive technologies, I think patients, because of social media and the ability to communicate with their physicians and other health care providers, because of the continuum of care, you will see a greater degree of patient empowerment, especially if we're asked to pay more and it comes directly out of our pocket, like in a copay arrangement, which is not uh, unthinkable. You may think it is now, but the world is rapidly changing. And keep in mind those numbers I showed you. Think demographics. We're getting older, folks. Um, that will have implications for the provision of health care, which has implications for the deployment of technology in health care. And remember, the title of this presentation is eHealth. It's not electronic health records. So when I say eHealth, I'm really talking about the deployment of technology in the provision of health care. I think social media will, will grow, uh, continue to be an important um, force, if I can use that word, um, in the deployment of technology and our use in the provision of health care services. And also keep in mind that um, we're moving more and more, even though we haven't really seen it on the front lines, we are moving more and more, you can see down the road, to personalized medicine, uh, much more um, about your genetics, um, much more about your genetic information and how that's used to provide you with better treatment in terms of chronic diseases. Um, conclusions, governance. We have a lot of e-health systems out there. Uh, we have a lot of stakeholders. Uh, Alberta, BC um, have addressed the subject of governance. You can debate whether or not they've done it right, but they have. Um, I have a constant complaint that in Ontario they haven't. I, don't, I think it's probably because, you know, if you're a politician, you only pick one or two fights a year. And in the healthcare sector, you know, so it's doctors this year, hospitals next. And you never really want to give them an issue where they can all gang up on you. And, and governance of health information, I think, is an issue where everybody would gang up. Because of all those different stakeholders, I think, and because we haven't really addressed the issue of governance, I think that there is some degree of necessity to consider a balancing of shareholder interests. I'd like to see patients, uh, um, patient interests um, a little higher up in terms of the, the power rankings. And at the end of the day, when you talk about the deployment of technology, um, you know, it's, how shall I phrase this? You know, it's, it's about people. It's not about the technology. Technology is a tool, you know. I feel like I should be like, you know, Gar Car you know, Charlton Heston and, you know, hold the gun up, you know, over my cold, dead hands, everybody, which he never did. Apparently, he never did that. But everybody remembers Charlton Heston as the spokesman or president of the NRA. Um, you know, and he's saying, you know, like, pry this weapon from my cold, dead hands. Um, pry this remote. Um, it's a tool. Just like guns are tools, you know. You know, they say guns don't kill people, people kill people. You know, in a sad fact, in a weird kind of way, that's true. And with technology, it's the same thing. It's not technology that's not going to hurt you or help you. It's going to be a tool. That's how people use those tools. And, you know, when you think of, you go into your bank, you know, you, they get, you know, yeah, they do talk to you a little bit about, they're so maybe overly loud at the teller or whatever, the counter. But for the most part, banks understand that they have to have a culture of confidentiality with respect to the information, client information. And, uh, you know, physicians sort of understand that. And I suppose other health prof professionals who have a variation on the Hippocratic Oath when they, when they get registered in their profession probably have that same, um, same awareness of the need for patient health information confidentiality. But when you look at the kinds of data breaches that go on, it's very clear that that, technolo that that awareness has not translated into the development of a culture of confidentiality to the extent that it should be. And I think the fact that we have information in electronic format that can be emailed, that can be communicated, that can be sent, that raises the stakes with respect to ingraining um, a better c culture of confidentiality, in my opinion. Others may differ, but I, I think. Um, that they need to have that culture, that cultural issue needs to be addressed. That includes more awareness, that includes more training, but it's certainly something that I think needs to be addressed. So when you think about 
the implications of e-health for privacy, what I would suggest to you is think in terms of, you know, you can, it's very easy to get lost in the weeds and talk about the shiny toys and the technology and what it can and can't do. But what I would ask you to do is I would, you know, come out of the weeds a little bit, look at the forest instead of the trees, and think about governance, think about the balance between stakeholders, and think about having appropriate uh, culture of confidentiality um, amongst healthcare providers in their deployment of technology in healthcare settings. And I think if you do that, then the deployment of technology can be, I think, a very positive thing for the provision of health care in this country, in any country. But it's like anything else, we have to do it right. So on that note, I'll close it now for, and I'll open it up for questions. Is that, is that my instruction? Yeah. This nice lady in the red dress has got me on a short leash. Um, and uh, you know, before I, I take any questions, just remember, thank you, and be careful out there. And on that note, okay, questions. Sir. No, they can't guarantee the confidentiality. I think you saw that little slide. Um, uh, and I, I, are the slides are made available later? Yeah. yeah, okay. So you'll see it there. But that's, you, you, go, you go look at that policy statement in that paragraph 13. No, I wouldn't say that at all. I think what you have to keep in mind is that if, you, if your physician puts your information, and I'll use you for an example. I like the sweater, by the way. I like that color. You know. um, if he puts it into his, uh, his or her electronic medical record, and by definition, that resides in their office. They may use a third-party service provider, but it's essentially theirs, and it's a closed system. Then, um, you know, vis-a-vis -vis you, they probably have a greater degree uh, of assurance that it will remain confidential because at that point there's really only three parties, right? There's you, your physician, and there's probably the service provider which is providing the technology to hold the database that holds the electronic or the application in the database that combines to form the electronic medical record. That's okay. When you think about data going into an electronic, like you, you, you go get a lab test. You know, the lab Certainly in Ontario, and I'm assuming here, I'm not quite sure of the state of, of your uh, e-health system here in Nova Scotia, but uh, you give, you know, you, you, you know, the old-fashioned way, you get a little slip, you go to the lab, they take a sample, you know, you go home, wait for the doctor's call. Um, the lab processes the sample, sends the result to the... Um, physician and sends a copy to the Ontario Lab Information System. You didn't know that, did you? Well, if you lived in Ontario, most people don't really know that. And it's your information in that fourth system, right? The one that's being run by the government. That, you know, that system is designed to be accessed by authorized personnel. And now you start getting into, well, how do I know somebody's authorized? How do I know their identity is correct? How do I know their purpose for checking it is correct? And that's where you start getting into the implications. And that's why when they say, when they talk about can't guarantee the confidentiality of information in an electronic health record, they are EHR, not EMR. That's the true statement, and they can't because the other people can access it. So they can, how can they guarantee the confidentiality of everybody and their dog can look at it if they're authorized?
could very well be set up that way. Most provinces are designed. Well, I don't know about borders, probably not. Uh, but keep in mind, like, you know, when they talk about electronic health records, right, it's the, the scenario they give is that, you know, if you get hit by a bus in Vancouver, you know, we can access your record in Nova Scotia. Well, think about that. Okay, so, okay, you can access my record in Nova Scotia. So it's no longer between you and your physician anymore. It's now in a system that can be author accessed by other people. So now you think about what's the security of that system? How do, I, how do I make sure nobody unauthorized accesses that system? How do I make sure that nobody uh, who may be authorized to access that, access that system um, accesses it for a correct purpose? So lots of different things that can happen. Any other questions? Okay, it wasn't that brilliant a presentation. Somebody must have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, processing. It's, you know, that when you think about the business process, and I don't blame hospitals for that. I mean, they're, you know, they're, they're dealing with the issue at hand. Like, they're, they, they need to get paid. They need to understand who you are, whether you're authorized to be able to, to receive that service. You know, you think about, uh, you know, healthcare fraud. You know, you know, you should go to some of these healthcare fraud conferences. And, you know, you, you, the stories you hear about people from California flying up to Alberta to get healthcare. And using uh, you know Ontario health card uh, IDs, fake Ontario health card IDs to get the services, and I'm sure the issue is the same in BC. I've, I have, can't speak to the issue in Ontario, especially in the Detroit Windsor area, but you know government says you know like we, we pay for certain services. We want to make sure that we got the right people, um, so they put in place the systems to govern that. And uh, you know I can go on, but. Stop there, because uh, am I'm, I'm, I'm I on time? Am I good? I got no time? I have three minutes. You got three minutes. Um, it's but these three here, and I, I was looking over there, so I don't know who put up their hand first. I'm going to pick you. Sorry. <coughs> Sorry? I, I apologize, I should have probably repeated the question. Sorry. Go ahead and I'll repeat the question. Um, what happens when you have doctors all over the earth and you meet and they die and all this? What happens to all your records, like your files? And is it all being stocked in all these offices? Is there some giant holding area where all your pin card and file is all? Um, the question is, is for the benefit of the audience, what happens to medical records uh, when a practice is terminated? And generally, um, there is no, uh, I'm not aware of, now this may vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, and I don't know what goes on in Nova Scotia, but I, I can certainly say this for Ontario. Um, there is no big holding tank in the sky. Um, you know, each college does impose medical record requirements on physicians, um, especially when they terminate their practice. Whether or not they do it uh, is a completely different issue. Um, what happens over the long term, who really knows? Uh, if the practice is sold and the records go to the, to the uh, succeeding physician or the succeeding practice, probably not an issue. But you do have cases where um, physicians just retire. And um, you know they put their records into storage, and then you know nobody pays, and the storage company shifts it off to the uh, landfill. You know these things happen. We we haven't quite figured out uh, the the key thing to remember about information, including personal information, is that it has a life cycle. You know it's born, it lives, it dies, but our record keeping systems and our management of information whether it's in a paper environment um, or in an electronic environment, you know, hasn't caught up to that, that fact of life. 
Um, I'm going to take one more, and then I'm going to go. Um, you two, ha you're, you're pretty close together. You're going to have to sort it out. Uh, the question is, you know, the, if I can paraphrase, the, what's the future of privacy uh, regulation in, in this country um, and it, how it relates to the culture of confidentiality or culture of privacy? Um, first of all, I don't think the Americans know where they are or where they're going. They take a very sectoral approach. Some things they do very, very, like, uh, it's, American lawyers, you know, I, I, you know, I'm very active in the American Bar Association and I joke about it a lot. You know, they, they like to draw a box, and they like to be in the box, and they know they won't get sued if they're in the box. Whereas Canadians and European lawyers would say, there's a box? You know, what's this box stuff? Um, so they're very meticulous and detailed, and they take a very sectoral approach. Um, the complaint is, is that they really need a comprehensive general law like we find in Canada and Europe. Um, I don't think Canada will go the way of Europe. That's a bit too regulated. I think Europe needs to ease up a little bit, take some Prozac, you know, chill out a little bit. Um, it's a bit too, too, I don't mean in the data protection part, but I mean in the regulatory, you know, I mean like the filings and all that sort of stuff. It may be that it, they need to do that there because of Europe, it's Europe. Uh, I don't think we're gonna go that way. Um, I think that you will see probably a greater degree of individual accountability you know, we will see more and more data breach notification requirements. Your, um, I think you will see um, a greater emphasis on, once we get over the regulatory stuff, like, you know, having a privacy policy, having a, a thing like that, I think we move in that direction more because of the security of information um, and the need for security. Uh, you know, uh, information, the state of information security in this country and in the world generally is pretty sad. Um, and I think that is changing. And as we get better at that, we probably will have more of a, a culture of confidentiality. We still have integrity issues in terms of privacy, but we still have access issues. Privacy is not security, they're not the same. Um, but, um, you know, it's more about the why you do as opposed to the how. But a lot of where I see us going is more in the how. I think people get the fact that we should be we should treat information confidenti confidentially, but you know it's a, it's it's a non-privacy thing. You know, like I think of PEI and the remember the Veterans Affairs. I know I'm running out of time. I've got one last. Give me two minutes. Um, you know, the uh, there was a breach at Veterans Affairs. You know, where they there was an activist and you know his health records were being shown all over the place. And um, uh, Chantal Bernier, who's the assistant privacy commissioner and I had a coffee in Ottawa and we actually talked about that and um, it, it turned out that it, it you know a, and it turned out that it was the issue was not so much a breach of systems or a breach of rules it was the interpretation of the rules within the culture and and you know it's almost I've, and I'm, I'm not putting words in her, her mouth but what I took away from it was it's like it's almost like a PEI thing you know it's a small community small population they're used to sharing information. They're used to, to, I don't mean sharing like every intimate detail, but it's closer. It's less distant. And when you're closer, you talk more and you talk, what are you gonna talk about? And these things start happening where you have these breaches of, of, of privacy, so to speak. Um, so whether you can achieve that kind of cultural, achieve that culture depends upon very much a lot of environmental concerns like that. That wouldn't happen in Toronto. We would be much more, and I'm not from Toronto, but Toronto people are weird. That's one thing I have discovered. Um, uh, I, I couldn't see that kind of data breach happening in Toronto because there's a little bit more distance, a little bit more awareness about the need to protect the privacy of, of other people. And I think on that note, I'm really running into other people's time. So you've been a wonderful audience. Don't forget, be careful out there. And on that note, um, enjoy the rest of the session.
Thanks, Michael. On behalf of Dalhousie University, thank you for joining us today. You certainly gave us lots to think about.